friends, and welcome to Conversations with Consequences. We are the ladies of the Catholic Association, bringing you witty and charming in-depth conversation on the topics that matter to you with the leading thinkers and movers of our time. Conversations with Consequences is part of the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Of course, our radio show is always a podcast, and you can listen by going to thecatholicassociation.org slash podcasts, or you can just go directly to wherever you listen to your podcasts. I'm your hostess, Dr. Gracie Christie. We have a great show lined up for you today. We're going to visit with a good friend, Erica Bakioki, later on in the show to discuss President Trump's Supreme Court nominee, Amy Coney Barrett, and what she sees as a new feminist icon in this amazing woman. Erica's new book, The Rights of Women, Reclaiming a Lost Vision, will be released in 2021. But first, it's great to have my TCA colleague and dear friend Maureen Ferguson with me as we introduce our first guest. Senator Tom Tillis of North Carolina has been gracious enough to join us. He is a member of the Senate Judiciary Committee, the committee that's preparing for the confirmation hearings of Judge Amy Coney Barrett later this month. Senator Tillis is a staunch pro-life supporter, and he's done great things amid the lockdown for the state's economy. He was also one of the main sponsors of the Paycheck Protection Program, a funding stream that has greatly helped families and companies across the country amid the coronavirus pandemic. He joins us uh, himself as he is quarantining at his home as he tested positive for COVID last week, very spectacularly, as all of us read in the news. Thankfully, he has no symptoms and he's been feeling great. Welcome to the show, Senator Tillis. Thank you. Senator Tillis, we're so grateful you're able to join us, and we're really looking forward to discussing the exciting news about Judge Amy Coney Barrett being appointed to the to the Supreme Court. So we understand you had the, the chance last week in Washington to meet with Judge Barrett, and we would love to hear your thoughts on her and what was your reaction to your meeting with her? Well, I uh, did have the opportunity to meet with her privately on Wednesday and briefly at the White House on uh a week ago Saturday, but I've known Judge Barrett since she first became uh, came before the Judiciary Committee for the Seventh Circuit nomination. She demonstrated incredible intellect and poise in the face of what I thought were unfair questions for her Seventh Circuit confirmation. Um, I believe that her outstanding record as a professor, her academic record, first at Notre Dame and, and Notre Dame Law, a magna cum laude at Rhodes College, uh, the broad base across the ideological spectrum of people who have worked with Judge Barrett, support her for moving forward to the uh, Supreme Court nomination. I look forward to being in committee next week, refreshing uh, maybe her work since she was confirmed to the Seventh Circuit, and I look forward to getting her confirmed to the bench. Senator, the last time we had a confirmation hearing, it turned into quite a circus. Uh, The attentions of all of America and probably the whole world were riveted on what was going on uh, at these hearings. Do you foresee anything like that happening again? I do. I I think that they're going to be more subtle. Uh, You know, Judge Barrett is the mother of seven children, two adopted from Haiti, one with special needs. She's going to be the first Supreme Court justice female ever confirmed with school aged children. Um, I think that they're going to try and mount the same kind of attacks that they did with Brett Kavanaugh. But maybe they will use their surrogates and other people to try and undermine this lady's great credentials, great academic record. Uh, That's why I'm so intent on getting there. I should get clear for uh, being in person by Tuesday next week. And I will get in my truck and ride up to D.C. and be sitting in the chair to make sure that they treat her fairly. But my guess is some will step out of bounds. And I think the American people will hold them accountable for that. Most people know that she's a great pick for the Supreme Court and she's going to be a great justice. Well, we're so relieved that you're feeling well and looking forward to hopping in your truck and driving up to these hearings next week. I was chuckling when I heard Senator Ron Johnson, who also had a COVID positive diagnosis. He said he's going to come to the floor to vote for her if he has to go in a moon suit. Yeah, Yeah, (laughs) Ron Ron and I talked. I said, no, why don't we go with the new SpaceX suits? They look a lot better and they're more modern. But uh, (laughs) either way, we're going to be there to to perform our duties uh, as U.S. senators. And I have every expectation that I will be there. Senator Lee, uh, who's also on the the, uh, Judiciary Committee, and then we'll vote it out of committee and have a vote on the floor 
the last week of October. There have been things in the news that said uh, against having the hearings just because of these positive COVID diagnoses like yours. Do you think that that has any merit or are these, is this just a, another a last minute way to delay this very important process? This is uh, Chuck Schumer uh, is not paying attention to how we've been operating in the U.S. Senate for months. We have done hybrid hearings. We have confirmed several circuit court judges and district court judges. We've carried most of the business of the judiciary through the, the virtual meetings. We have to be there and present to vote. But, you know, it, it's disingenuous to say that we want you there in person, but they're refusing. Most of the members on the other side of the aisle have refused to meet with Judge Barrett. So it seems a bit contradictory on the one hand to say we all need to be there and on the other hand say we don't want to even be there to meet with her in person when she's perfectly prepared to meet with them, address any concerns that they have for an hour or more. Uh, Chuck Schumer really wants to keep this seat open, so it will pave the way for him to expand the courts and pack it with liberal activist judges so that we'll have nine or 13 justices that are no more than a third chamber of the Congress legislating from the bench. That's what Chuck Schumer's agenda is about, and that's exactly why we're moving forward with the hearing according to the Senate rules, and we will get her confirmed before the end of October. Well, it, it sure does seem disrespectful that many of the Democrats on the committee are refusing to even meet with her, especially because of the likelihood that she will indeed be our next Supreme Court justice. So we certainly appreciate your perseverance in getting yourself healthy and getting back to work. And we appreciate so much that you're even working this week from home. So with the hearings, what do you expect? Because we know, of course, last time Judge Barrett was before the committee, there were all kinds of attacks on her faith. We know from Senator Feinstein, Senator Durbin, Senator Hirono, and Senator Kamala Harris, who, of course, now is the vice presidential nominee, attacking Amy Barrett because of her faith, attacking other nominees, one because he was a member of the Knights of Columbus, saying another was unfit for office because of his litigation work on religious liberty cases. So can you can you share your thoughts on that and, and on Senator Harris, Kamala Harris in particular? Well, you know, as a lifelong Catholic, as a member of the Knights of Columbus when I've heard them say those kinds of things on the committee, I take it personally which is one of the reasons why I want to be there in person. They have to be held accountable when you attack a nominee for their faith. A line that no member should cross. But you've seen Harris, you, you, you saw some of her famous uh, what I consider to be abhorrent behavior against Judge Kavanaugh. I think we're going to see again a more nuanced, a more sophisticated way of attacking Judge Barrett, but I have have no doubt that they will attack her and they will attack her for her faith. She is an independent jurist. She's somebody who interprets the plain meaning of the words of the Constitution and the statutes as they're written. And that scares liberal activist members of the Senate and liberal activist judges because it puts them in the lanes that are intended for, intended for the judiciary. And they really do want the judiciary to do their work. If you remember, Neil Gorsuch famously said to several members on the other side of the aisle. It's not my job to do your job. Mm -hmm. There were a number of instances where they were questioning his opinions in the past. And he said that the statute said this, the Constitution says that if you want a different outcome, then do your job and change the law. But Chuck Schumer and Dick Durbin and uh, Senator Harris want a legislate. They want a judiciary that will legislate from the bench. And that's not good for democracy. It's certainly not good for our three institutions of government. That's absolutely right. And Judge Barrett has made it so clear, you know, her beliefs about the role of a judge, that the lawmakers should write the laws and the judges should do their job, which is not to be policymakers. If you're just tuning in, you're listening to Conversations with Consequences on EWTN Radio. I'm your hostess, Dr. Gracie Christie, and I'm here with my colleague Maureen Ferguson, and we're chatting with Senator Tom Tillis of North Carolina. So, Senator, you mentioned um, a few moments ago about the other side of the aisle wanting to pack the court. Could you explain to the American people what that means exactly and how possible it, it, it could what what implications does it have and how possible is it that it could happen if in fact the administration changes 
If the administration changes, uh, that is, uh, Senator or Vice President Biden is elected president and Chuck Schumer is the majority leader, he has publicly said as late as last week that he would not waste a majority. He's also called on his members to vote to remove the 60 vote threshold, which makes the U.S. Senate unique among all Democratic institutions, forcing bipartisanship to get things done because we know it's what the majority of the American people want. He's prepared to go to a simple majority of 51 votes. He's also said that he supports expanding the court. Um, So think about going from nine justices to 13 justices. Joe Biden has refused to to publish a list of the judges, and many of us believe that that's because it will be among some of the most liberal activist judges that we've seen put forth to the bench in decades. With a simple majority and the ability to expand the Supreme Court, many people think the Supreme Court gets expanded by constitutional change, but it's a pure statute change. And if Chuck Schumer only requires 51 votes to pass a measure out of the Senate, then they will expand the Supreme Court and they will pack it with judges that will be activist judges that will be damaging to the institution, the Article Three branch, and be damaging to this nation. He said he doesn't want to waste the majority. He said he wants to expand the Supreme Court. He also said that he doesn't want Joe Biden to publish his list because he knows if the American people understood who was on that list, that they would soundly reject Joe Biden, and they would certainly reject losing a majority in the U.S. Senate. What would it mean for the for the American people in a practical sense? What kinds of what kind of impact would they feel in their lives if the court was packed and and there were a preponderance of these uh, liberal jurists who legislate basically from the bench? It's, It's a great question. Everyone needs to understand the Supreme Court is not this removed body that doesn't touch the individual. So many landmark cases that go before the Supreme court are based in something done wrong to an individual by the government. I think that our religious liberties will be at risk. I think our right to free speech will be at at risk. It'll be whatever they prefer to be the right kind of free speech. I think our Second Amendment rights will be attacked. I mean, it it is a threat to the individuals even more, more than anyone else. If you take a look at the landmark cases over time, it was normally or there are cases where an individual was harmed that went to the highest court of the land to make sure that the rights of the Constitution were preserved. With activist judges, I think our religious liberties, our speech, our Second Amendment rights, and all of the rights that we hold dear in this nation, unique among all other nations, could be at risk. So much at stake here. Do you, do you have a sense that your constituents understand how much is at stake? And what, do you, what would you encourage our listeners to do in terms of communicating with their senators about the nomination of Judge Barrett and these other issues surrounding packing the court. And I would love to see Joe Biden fleshed out on his list of nominees for the Supreme Court, because I think that is really a frightening prospect. Well, one thing I would encourage them to do, my uh, chief of staff was formerly the senior counsel on uh, the nominations uh, judiciary committee, and um, he has a a thorough knowledge of potential uh, nominations that would be put forth. I would go out to Joe JoeBidenJudges.com and take a look at some of the ones that were being vetted during the Obama mm-hmm. administration that are a potential, what we think are a, a rational list of potential nominations in a Biden administration with Chuck Schumer holding the majority. But to your point, uh, we are, we're spending a lot of time trying to educate the voters of North Carolina what's at stake because many of them think it's a constitutional change. They don't understand that it could happen within weeks of the, the new Congress coming in. And it truly could be a turning point for this nation. The nuclear filibuster, uh, a few years ago, I was criticized for not being willing to vote for a simple majority when we had complete control of Washington. It was wrong then, and I was in the majority, and it would be wrong in the future because we could literally turn this country in a direction it's never gone, and we could destroy the credibility of the Supreme Court and the entire district and circuit court system because it's very likely that they too would be expanded. Well, I'm glad that you're on the job, Senator Tillis. It sounds like something, it it sounds terrifying when when you speak about it. 
and I'm glad that you've explained it to our listeners because I think I think that some of these details um, are hard to grasp because they are so transformative of the way that our country runs and the, and the way that citizens experience life in this country. Oh, there's no question about it. And up until this election, I never seriously thought that this was uh, what it's what's at stake. But unlike prior elections, when I know that Chuck Schumer and some of the other members would like it, they would never run on it. And in fact, they're even using this as a litmus test for several Democrat candidates they did back in the primaries about whether or not they would support the nuclear option for the legislative filibuster and whether or not they would support packing the courts. So they're beginning to talk about it openly. AOC and Chuck Schumer sharing the stage just last week talking about the subject. This is a real threat to our democracy. Senator Tillis, I heard one of your colleagues, Senator Lee, say something about how if the Democrats add all these seats to the courts, then when Republicans are in control, they'll feel they have to add seats to the court. And pretty soon the Supreme Court will look like the Galactic Senate in Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, you know, I thought that was a pretty funny image. <laughs> well, it is a funny image, but it communicates a very serious threat. Uh, when will it end? We, you know, we've heard Joe Biden uh, say that he thinks the nine justices are enough. But what we haven't heard him say is that he would veto legislation that would expand the courts. And if he's serious about not expanding the courts, why doesn't he say that? Why doesn't he issue his list of judges for the American people to decide? I believe it is because this will almost certainly happen under a Biden uh, White House and a Schumer-led Senate. Senator, switching gears here for a moment, you were instrumental in the, the Paycheck Protection Program in passing that. And thank God, because so many of us uh, have depended on that with, with the terrible lockdowns, which on top of the COVID uh, epidemic was, was um, just really hard on so many Americans. It also, the Paycheck Protection Program also helped many Catholic schools and, and other Catholic entities stay open. And that was a wonderful thing because it, it, it can be very, it would, it's very easy to imagine that our Catholic institutions could have been left out altogether. And under a different administration, I'm sure they would have been left out altogether. So now, um, how is your state of uh, North Carolina doing? And how? what are you working on to get your state uh, you know, back up and running? Well, we're fortunately, uh, I came into the legislature and was uh, elected Speaker of the House in 2011. And we truly transformed our economy. We were one of the worst performing states in 2010. Now we're one of the top performing states. We were hit hard by COVID it as well, but not near as hard as we would have been if we hadn't reduced taxes and reduced regulations and, and had a great success story, turnaround story. But businesses are still suffering. Uh, the Paycheck Protection Program, the funding for schools, the funding for child care, vaccine research was critically important. When we first passed the CARES Act, I voted for a measure four weeks ago to provide additional funding for the Paycheck Protection Program to expand the institutions that could get it. 5016s, a lot of nonprofits who have been hit hard uh, and were providing services throughout the pandemic need to also be able to make their payroll and uh, their donations are down at the same time that their demands are up. Um, we need to get a follow up to the Paycheck Protection Program. We must provide additional funding for school, including private and parochial schools. $105 billion is what we propose to safely open schools. These kids have to get back safely into a classroom setting for child care, for parents who may want to go back to work, but if their schools are closed, they need child care options. Um, we're still continuing to work. I know the president recently announced that he's stopping negotiations with Speaker Pelosi right now, but we're continuing to work in the Senate with the House to try and come up with a follow-up bill. Where we fall short, however, is a measure that would provide a trillion dollars to failed states like North, like New York, York and California that were failing long before COVID came. I think there's an argument to be made for providing some resources to states, but not a bailout for states that have failed for the past several decades. But most important, we need to help individuals with the unemployment extension, with the Paycheck Protection Program, with vaccine research and funding for schools and daycare. That's something I've already voted on, and it's something I hope I get an opportunity to vote again in the coming days or weeks. Um, Senator, we don't have much time left, but we wanted to quickly get your reaction to the president's executive order on the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act, because 
because we we know you've been such an advocate for the unborn in the Senate, and we appreciate that so much. So can you share any thoughts you have on this executive order? Well, I'm glad the president did it. We, we uh, Clearly, we need to follow up with a statute for it to have staying power. But to me, I think the whole debate over the Supreme Court, the Democrats want to move to Roe v. Wade, but what they really want to shift the tension away from are partial birth and late-term abortions that the majority of the people in America think it's embarrassing and disgraceful to think that the United States is one of only seven nations that allow this. Countries like China and North Korea. I just had a uh, my six my, my granddaughter turn seven weeks old today. She was born three weeks premature. And when I hold her in my arms, thinking when she was uh, three weeks old, the date of her the, the week of her scheduled due date, thinking that three weeks prior, the Democrats support a policy that could take that precious viable life that came home from the hospital within 24 hours away is uh, it's heartbreaking. And I think that that's what we have to continue to remind people when they're talking about Roe v. Wade and the Supreme Court. The Democrats are trying to shift the tension away from a radical policy that the majority of people in the United States thinks is not something that should be the law of the land in the United States and in North Carolina. Well, thank you so much for making those points, uh, Senator. It's so true that the American people are not the people of late term abortion. And I hope that you will continue to always champion that and that we get some real legislation on the books soon. And Senator, thank you so much for your time. And we'll keep you and your family in our prayers. We will envision you in that truck heading up to D.C. to make it to that to that hearing. And we will pray for a wonderful for wonderful announcements from the hearing and, an, and a confirmation of, of, of that judge. So thank you. Well, thank you all. God bless you. Maureen, it was so kind of the senator to join us. And this week we have been hearing from another member of the Senate Judiciary Committee, Vice Presidential nominee Kamala Harris. And uh, we got to watch her debate with with Vice President Pence. It was extremely illuminating. I think that uh, for me, it was very, it was a clash of personalities that I was watching. Mike Pence is very, very stable, very generous, very gentlemanly. His way of of expressing himself is um, someone you'd like to have around the kitchen table, I think. Unfortunately, her personality didn't come through so pleasantly for me. How was it for you, Maureen? I couldn't have been more delighted with Vice President Pence's performance. He really is such a steady guy. Um, Like you said, the guy you'd want around your kitchen table. But he's been such a steadying force in this administration. Uh, We were all laughing in my house about the fly that landed on his head. Because even with a fly (laughs) on his head, he, he didn't flinch. You know, so I think that's emblematic of his steadiness. He seems really, like he really someone you'd want around in a crisis, right? He'd be he'd be so steady exactly and and, right. and and just very calm and infusing the whole situation uh, with with just the right attitude. Exactly right, and I I think uh, Senator Harris has a little bit of a snarky tone, and that may work in some situations. But I think uh, Vice President Pence is such a gentleman that it didn't really work with him. You know, as Catholics watching the debate, uh, we always have our our, fi- our first principles are always uh, we have our antennas up and listening on abortion. I I didn't think I didn't. On abortion, I was a little concerned with with the positions that we saw uh, Kamala Harris take. Well, the contrast between the two couldn't be more stark. Of course, Vice President Pence has a a long record of fighting for the unborn, really. And I thought he very effectively pointed out the extreme nature of Senator Kamala Harris's position on abortion. She's in favor of late term abortion, taxpayer funded abortion. And there just there couldn't be more clear contrast on the issue of life. And she has a record that we can point to, doesn't she? She was the uh, attor- the state attorney general of California. That's right. So we, we don't have to imagine what life would be like if Senator Harris were ever to assume the presidency. Um, she, as you mentioned, she was the attorney general of California, and she was very aggressive in prosecuting a pro-life undercover journalist, David Daleiden, uh, really sort of flaunting a- any veneer of fairness and uh, you know equal administration of the law. She, she very aggressively prosecuted him in a very unfair way. In another case, uh, NIFLA versus uh, Becerra, which this was a pregnancy center case. Uh, When she was the attorney general, this case, which made it 
all the way to the Supreme Court was actually NIFLA versus Harris when it started off. That's right. Um, But it involved the free speech rights of a pregnancy center, pregnancy centers who are out there helping women in crisis. And she was not just forcing to silence them, but she was forcing them to speak a pro-abortion message, essentially forcing them to advertise for abortion. So it it doesn't take a lot of imagination to uh, know how she would treat people of faith and pro-life people uh, if she reaches higher office. You know, as Catholics, we're also very attentive to anything when it comes to religious liberty. How did the the candidates um, square off on that point, do you think? Well, again, the stark, the contrast couldn't be more stark. Uh, and I, I feel like that was one of the biggest whoppers of this debate for me uh, was when Senator Harris said um, uh, Pence had raised the issue of religious liberty and Harris responded by saying it's insulting to suggest that we would knock anyone for their faith, which when you look at her record and her performance in the Senate Judiciary Committee, specifically on judicial nominees, she attacked a, a really well qualified, wonderful judge um, a, a nominee because he was a member of the Knights of Columbus. Uh, because the Knights of Columbus, of course, has pro-life views on abortion and uh, supports church teaching on marriage. There was another nominee for office. She said he was unfit for office because he had participated in religious liberty litigation. So when she claimed that she has respect for people of faith that's different than her own, that was really the biggest whopper of the night. I remember those things well, and I'm wondering if we're going to see a repeat of this when it comes to her work on the Senate Judiciary Committee and their interviews of um, Amy Coney Barrett. Well, they've had such a backlash for their their attacks on Amy Coney Barrett's faith. Uh, I don't think they're going to back off, though. I think perhaps it will just be more subtle. So we we should stay tuned. Next week are the hearings, and um, we couldn't have a better nominee than Amy Coney Barrett. I do feel that she's going to be very much on top of things, and, um, and she's just going to knock it out of the park. I really do feel that. I think so, too. Next on the show, we chat with an amazing woman. She's a good friend of the show, Erica Bakioki. She has written extensively and with great impact on President Trump's Supreme Court nominee, Amy Coney Barrett. Her focus is on this new kind of feminism that we see in our hopefully soon to be new Supreme Court justice. Erica's new book, The Rights of Women, Reclaiming a Lost Vision, will be released in 2021. You're listening to Conversations with Consequences on EWTN Radio. Welcome back to Conversations with Consequences, the weekly radio show of the Catholic Association, broadcasting every Saturday at 5 p.m. on EWTN Radio. I'm your hostess, Dr. Gracie Christie. Erica, welcome to the show. Thank you, Grachi, for having me. It's really a pleasure to be with you. We had to have you on because I read a piece of yours just came out a few days ago in Politico about the topic of the week, the topic of the century, it seems, the new Supreme Court nominee who's called Amy Coney Barrett. If you haven't heard, I think the whole world's heard about her. The name of your piece was Amy Coney Barrett, a new feminist icon. And it was really interesting to me because it explores something that I think all of us felt, if not in a very conscious way, at least subliminally, was that uh, this nominee of of President Trump's is a woman who presents a different vision of the successful woman and and a challenge to what people have been conditioned to think of as as a successful woman by these currents of feminism that have been going on and bathing all of us in decades. So I really liked your perspective. And so what were you trying to get across in this piece? Thank you. Yeah, you know, she is just really an incredible woman. I mean, putting aside (laughs) the possibility of her, uh, you know, serving on the Supreme Court, if you um, spend any time watching some of these really beautiful videos, uh, video interviews of her that are on YouTube, Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, talking about her family, her marriage, um, and you just see a real heroic woman, a woman of immense generosity. Um, we already know, you know, we've heard so much about her really kind of singular intellect, which is, um, uh, and then you hear too of her humility. And I think all of those put together in one person mm -hmm. is quite extraordinary. So I think she's already an extraordinary woman apart from, you know, now being tapped for um, the highest court in the land. So what I really wanted to show is, um, you know, it's funny, I've been uh, working on, on a book um, that you mentioned in the intro for many years now that's really come out of a lot of my um, my legal work um, kind of as a, as a sort of legal um, theorist. And, you know, she kind of embodies <laughs> here in flesh and blood really the theory that um, I've been uh, pull, pulling together. And I think what's really important, especially, you know, for my critics now on Twitter and in my email box to understand is that the theory that I present here of um, real the common responsibilities of, you know, uh, fathers and mothers um, in caring for their children has a very long pedigree, especially within women, uh, among sort of women's rights advocates. And I think that, you know, there's such a myopia about these issues where, um, you know, people can only see sort of uh, an understanding of women's rights through the lens of 1970s, especially, you know, RBG feminism, that it's hard for them to understand the possibility of thinking about women's rights without, you know, Roe sort of as the centerpiece. And so my book really goes on. It's a historical, um, philosophical and legal sort of look at this long, long movement um, of women's rights advocates. And and so just wanted to sort of show that she's um, she really embodies um, this ideal. You made a big point in your piece about the fact that Amy Coney Barrett and her husband are truly raising their children with the children at the center of their marriage. In other words, whatever the children need, that's what comes first. Their professions come second, but both their professions come second, and they're able to balance um, those two professions and take turns um, going back and forth between the, the needs of each person professionally in the marriage. Do you find that that is a model for working women to follow in the future, a model um, that could work for many people? Yeah, you know, I think that's really the key is that the model, um, the instantiation or the manifestation of sort of a theory of shared or common responsibility in uh, in sort of domestic life and caring for children really has to be um, sort of discerned by each couple, depending on the needs of their children, first and foremost, their own talents, you know, what they um, you know, feel called to and are capable of in the public sphere, but also their financial situation, whether they have, you know, family around, um, their childcare situation. I mean, all these things are something that have to be discerned for each couple. And so there are certainly, um, you know, there are, are um, many, many couples who still have a more um, traditional or even neo-traditional sort of approach where the husband is more of a breadwinner. I mean, you see this in the data when they start to have children in the home. And then women are, you know, very highly educated women are doing um, more part-time work or seeking part-time work in order to stay, kind of have their their um, their foot, you know, still in the workplace to some extent. But then you also see flip-flops sometimes. You know, I know a family um, where the woman is a nuclear physicist. They have seven children. The husband was, you know, a history major and has homeschooled the children um, and used his, you know, major very well <laughs> in educating these, actually an abundance of girls, in fact, um, to be really impressive young women who are going off, you know, to do impressive things. Um, and then he then is going back to try to find some part-time work at first as the killed children go old, uh, grow older. And then I suspect we'll try to get back full-time into the, in, um, into the workplace. And I think that's sort of the shift that has to be seen is that the, you know, the, the focus on the children and the children's needs in the home should also be what the focus is uh, in the marketplace and in our public institutions too, is if we looked at children's needs first um, and sort of oriented things around that, I think we'd be a much, much uh, happier society. And of course, this goes, this flies in the face of traditional uh, feminism, which you've called in, you called in a different article, another article that I really enjoyed, you called it autonomy feminism. And this, that's the kind of feminism that RBG uh, exemplified. And you call Amy Coney Barrett's brand of feminism, dignitarian feminism. How, what is the difference between those two types? 
Yeah. So if you don't mind me going sort of back in the history here, I think a really helpful way of thinking about this is um, the term that's it's used in like evolutionary biology, especially, but it's been very helpful, I think, um, conceptually for me in thinking about the differences between men and women. You know, you have in the 1980s, there was a lot of discussion among uh, feminists about sameness or equality, and they kind of split into groups, you know, difference feminists versus, uh, you know, you know, uh, uh, equity or um, equality feminists. And then with even within Catholic thinking, especially with John Paul II and kind of the new feminism that he called for, you hear, you know, the talk of kind of equal dignity and complementarity. And though I find those things helpful, I don't think that they actually um, uh, are as helpful as they could be. And I think the term reproductive asymmetry is a bit better. And let me just give you a quick bio, uh, biographical reason for that is that I actually, you know, um, you know, uh, kind of cut my teeth in college on, you know, women's studies classes. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I um, was a, a women's studies student. I was one of the leaders of my women's center at Middlebury College in the 90s. And so when I came back to the church, actually through kind of a new appreciation of abortion, I had been a very, very um, pro, pro-abortion, pro pro-choice uh, feminist, and a new kind of thinking around abortion I started to see, wow, the Catholic Church is the only one that really cares about, you know, <laughs> this, mm-hmm. this issue in the right way and came around, um, I started to read some of the material in the church on women. And and I think, so I think complementarity is, is helpful, but it doesn't really help feminists really see what what um, what the Catholic Church holds up in, ter- in terms of the, the dignity of both and then the complementarity because we feminists tend to see it in a fractional, fractional complementarity way of thinking, which is Sister Prudence Allen uh, uses that term to describe sort of the way that, you know, men are the head and women are the heart. And that is not what her view of integral complementarity is, or most people view complementarity, but I think a lot of feminists see that way. And so they get confused and caught up. So I think this idea of of sexual or reproductive asymmetry is helpful because what it does is it, it helps us to see that there are certain burdens that, that are borne by women and privileges by men and vice versa um, that injustice we ought to sort of respond to. And so, of course, one of those, the most central, is childbearing. Obviously, it's both a privilege and a burden that, that women carry that men don't. And so what's the response we make to that? And historically, there have been all sorts of responses. And so just to sort of map out sort of three or four movements very quickly, you know, there's the sort of pre-industrial or agrarian time, um, a long, long time of our history when there was a lot of collaboration um, among husband and wife in the home just based on economic and, you know, need and need of um, caring for the children and their and their family and all of that. But there was still a real strong division of labor in part because of just the physical strength that men have, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, in, you know, it makes sense to sort of be the ones going out as um, out in, in the fields, although, of course, women did that too. And then there's the rise of liberalism and industrialization where you start to see separate spheres, really strong separate spheres, where you have women in the private sphere and men who have become kind of, you know, individual public citizens and wage earners are going out into the public. And so women then become sort of relegated to the private sphere. Um, but then also, as to- Tocqueville noted, um, you know, that the, the public sphere really depended on what women were doing in the private sphere in terms of, you know, inculcating virtue and all of that, which is always what was understood, you know, to be the, you know, done in the life of the home. Mm-hmm. So when you come, when you get to the women's movement in the 19th and the 20th centuries, there's a desire for women to start participating in public life, but not only for, you know, raw, raw, you know, power kinds of reasons, but also because they thought they, you know, wanted to make contributions um, and, um, you know, exercise um, their kind of God-given intelligence and and um, and benefit society too. I mean, think of of the women who worked on abolition and worked on um, kind of you know labor and uh, um, workers' rights kinds of things in the 19th century. I mean, really important work, temperance and all and all of these kinds of moral moral issues. Um, so you then um, come to this, uh, you know, start to see that there's this question about um, as the economy shifts and work is less, you know, there's less of a need for kind of physical strength. Um, you know, the, the, you know, in both World War One and World War Two, you saw women take over in a lot of spheres that they had been kept out of and take over for men. And you started to see that they were capable of, of that kind of work. Um, and of course, all the work they had done in these progressive causes. And so you, women start to, to really enter the public sphere much more in the 1960s. 
And then what happens is this, you know, horrible shift (laughs) where um, the idea is that, you know, in order for women who have been in the private sphere to go into the public sphere, they have to imitate men and not just men, but these unencumbered men of the liberal kind of imagination, Um, you know, and, and I think that that's really where you have the biggest problem is this idea that you need to have abortion, you need to have women be unpregnant, untethered, unencumbered by children children who remain, who have to remain outside of any thoughts of the public sphere, rather than the public sphere being entirely kind of, not entirely, but, you know, you know, prioritize um, that care and, and the need for children, upon which every single economic, social and political good, you know, depends is the care for children and the upraising of children. So that's where we see a real real shift in the movement um, that happens. So we created historically through all these different all these different currents that you talk about, we created the the success model for the success the model for the successful woman, right? Who is completely autonomous and and has that same disdain for connections and and duties and responsibilities of the home and of of the children that you might imagine a a completely free man to have, correct? I mean I don't know that Yeah, that's right. I don't know that many free men. I know, I know, and that's the thing is it's this kind of mythical man like who is this autonomous man but I think that's an important point too is that when you start to see the women's rights advocates not only of you know in our country but the real big theorist of women's rights in the late 19th century with Mary Wollstonecraft in a vindication of the rights of women she's articulating you know a, a reason for women having rights not based on some sort of Um, sort of Lockean approach, but really it's based in this idea that women have duties just Mm -hmm. like men do to themselves to develop, you know, the reason that, you know, that God has given them to to their families, to care for their, you know, their, their homes and their children, just like men have, um, and to the public sphere in their countries, right. And to their God, you know, to, to search for truth. And so for Mary Wollstonecraft, we, we want these rights in order to fulfill our duties. And that becomes the way that the early women's rights advocates think about rights. And it's a, it's a, understanding that has very, very kind of ancient roots um, is, you know, rights and freedom are for the purpose of wisdom and virtue. You know, they're not just kind of free floating, you know, assertions of autonomy, um, but they're really to fulfill duties. And so so that is what is needs to sort of reemerge, right? So you connect this kind of this success model that includes autonomy always. You connect it to abortion. You say um, in this in this new feminism, sexual equality is found not in imitating men's capacity to walk away from an unexpected pregnancy through abortion, but rather in asking men to meet women at a high standard of mutual responsibility, reciprocity, and care. So you're drawing a direct line between the legalization of abortion and this idea of irresponsibility being the model model that not only men should adhere to, but also women. Yeah, that's right. And so many people before me have, you know, uh, poked at feminism in this way, right? It's, you know, the imitation of kind of the worst kind of men. And, you know, you saw that, especially, I think, at the Women's March in, um, right after, yes. you know, President, Bush, President, sorry, President Trump. Um, you know, in prior times, I mean, there was a great Women's March in 1913, where women dressed in this, these gorgeous clothes, and they had these giant signs that said charity and love and and justice and peace and they you know wrote you know beautiful um prose and all these types of things and made reasoned arguments right Mm -hmm. and in the women's march you see the vulgarity and you see the vulgarity on my twitter feed and you see the vulgarity in my email well and even and even a kind of and a kind of violence that's inherent in so much of it like you'll see that these women carrying these signs with violent sentiments and they'll have their little girls with them and their little boys that's right and that's that's a very it's very shocking and jarring And it's why Amy Coney Barrett stands as such a model for this other approach, because she's so lovely. You know, she's so lovely. She's she's and I don't want to, you know, try to I'm sure she has her faults. We haven't seen them as far as I'm concerned. But um, but she just has she's a she's a woman who is who is brilliant, who is humble, who is generous, who is loving, who, you know, cares for her in her community and all of these things. Um, but she has the credentials to sit on the Supreme Court, too. And and I think that that's, um, you know, the model of um, kind of, you know, wanting to use her intellect and her talents, immense as they are, to serve her community and her country is really something that we need to bring back. You know, it's something that 
I think our country was very much founded on this idea and was successful for, you know, for a long time because of this approach that we use our talents, um, you know, to serve others. And I think what we have now is this real assertion of, you know, my body, myself, um, you know, my body, my rights, my body, my choice, my, 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 and instead of any sense of responsibility and duties to others. And Erica, this, this kind of thinking really leaves a terrible emptiness inside women and also men, of course, because all of us are suffering, um, regardless of where we stand in the family, we all suffer from, from that, uh, the emptiness of, of the, of the total selfishness that is being sold to us as the way that we can be happy. Um, in the end, It makes us very sad and disconnected. Um, when when we're disconnected from our duties, we're disconnected from love, love itself, right? Because yeah. in our hearts, our hearts are called to serve and and to give of ourselves to others, especially our family members. And in in your piece, you make a connection in it with um, our own particular moment that we're living in now uh, during COVID, during the lockdown. With there's so much suffering and economic hardship and and loneliness. What what connection do you draw there? Yeah, you know, I, I think it's interesting. Um, it's a, it is really a hard time, and there's no question that our country is, you know, facing this kind of um, real feelings of yeah, distress and real hate in some in some quarters because we've you know been locked up and mm -hmm. away from people uh, for so long. But I think you know, I just I think that it's really you know a one by one approach. I mean, even in response to this. To this article I've written, you know, I've had email um, sent to me that's really started <laughs> um, in real, you know, strong critique, not necessarily of arguments, although I have had those, which I really appreciated. But one thing that's been really beautiful to see is um, in me reaching back out, you know, and just kind of meeting them where they are and, um, and really wanting to engage them just to see how quickly things can turn and people can still disagree. And yet we can begin to have some sort of discussion when we're not seeing each other as enemies, but trying to sort of get to the bottom of a problem. And so I love that, you know, there's been really good discussions. I think on Twitter when the, when the concern, when I hear the concern is poor women and children, that's where I want to be. Let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, I deal a, little, a, a bit more um, about that, um, that issue in particular in an article I wrote for America magazine, actually earlier in the week, um, what I'll teach my children about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, where I get into more about, you know, how this way of handling, you know, the asymmetries between men and women is really hardest on poor women and, and therefore poor children. Um, and I think that that's a real, really important for us to, if we're, if we're all talking about those, that kind of situation, I mean, real vulnerability there, then that's where I want to be. That's where I, I, I don't mind having disagreements there. I, I, I'd like to be there. And so I think if we can move from acrimony to really trying to see each other Um, as, you know, having some semblance of humanity, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. you know, that, that would be really, really wonderful. Well, I think with you, it's easy, Erica. I'm sure that people who engage with you always come away feeling that you are a person who cares because you obviously are. And we'll have to look out for your piece. I'm going to look up your piece in America Magazine. Meanwhile, our listeners should be looking out for your new book, The Rights of Women Reclaiming a Lost Vision. And thank you for joining us, Erica Bakioki. Thank you. Every morning, the Catholic Association reviews all the latest news and sends our subscribers a carefully curated collection of the most important news of the day. Items are specifically selected for a smart Catholic audience like you. Don't let the world take you by surprise. Subscribe to our daily media roundup at thecatholicassociation.org. And now, Father Roger Landry offers us, as is customary, a short and inspiring homily to prepare us for this Sunday's Gospel. This is Father Roger Lehner, and it's a privilege for me to be with you as we enter into the consequential conversation the risen Lord Jesus wants to have with each of us this Sunday. In the Gospel, Jesus will speak to us about the kingdom of heaven, the invitation he's given us to join him there forever, but how we need to respond to that invitation. He does so within the context of a parable about salvation history in which he illustrates for us basically how not to respond. He concludes the parable by saying, Many are invited, but few are chosen. We obviously want to be numbered among the chosen few. Chosen ones are not those whom God somehow favors over others. They're those who respond fully to having been chosen by God. Therefore, it's important for us to pay close attention to what Jesus tells us today, so that we will respond to his invitation well, choose him who has chosen us, and help the many we know also learn how to become among the chosen too.
Jesus compares the kingdom of heaven to a wedding banquet a king is throwing for his son. God wants all to come to the feast he's throwing for Jesus. He wishes all people to be saved. But there are various aspects of this parable we need to ponder. First part is the invitation. Jesus says that the king sent his servants to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they wouldn't come. When they didn't respond the first time, he gave them a second chance. He sent other servants saying, tell those who have been invited, behold, I've prepared my banquet. My calves and my fattened cattle have been slaughtered. Everything's ready. Come to the feast. But again, they made light of it. They made excuses. One went to his farm, another went to his business. Yet others seized the servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The servants that Jesus had been describing up until now are the prophets who had been sent by God to invite the Jews to this feast. But as we talked about last week in the, Jesus, in the parable Jesus gives us of the tenant farmers in the master's vineyard, all of the prophets were mistreated and killed by the people receiving this invitation at communion with God. Only some, like obviously the Blessed Virgin, St. Joseph, the Apostle, and those who became Jesus' disciples, responded to the invitation. But God kept inviting still. The servants went out a third time and gathered all whom they found, both the good and the bad. Jesus says, so that the wedding hall was filled with guests. This is the mission of the church. We don't have a church only for the good and the holy. God expands his guest list and invites everyone. We shouldn't be surprised, therefore, that in the church we'll find great saints and great sinners, that we'll find the faithful and the hypocrites. Some respond to God's invitation by showing up, but without conversion. They're invited, but not chosen, because they don't cooperate with God's desire to choose them. We see this in what Jesus says about the wedding garment. When the king came in to meet the guests, Jesus says, he noticed a man there who was not dressed in a wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how is it that you came in here without a wedding garment? And the man was speechless. And the king said to the attendants, bind his hands and his feet and cast him into the darkness outside where there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. At first glance, it might seem that the king is crazy and cruel. He commanded his servants to invite the man to the feast. And then he's picky about what he's wearing. But the truth in the ancient world was that when kings would summon everyone to the feast, they, knowing that many would be poor and not have proper vesture, would normally send out the royal tailors to make proper clothing for everyone invited, or otherwise provide fitting digs. It would be like a rich man today inviting a bunch of homeless people to a black tie dinner, but then giving them free hotel rooms to shower and providing free tuxes, shoes, and gowns to wear. With this history, it's not difficult to recognize why the king would be, would be so upset about seeing this improperly attired man. This man deliberately refused to wear the clothing that was required and made available. The lesson for all of us is that it's not enough for us just to show up. We too have to be properly dressed for the feast. We have to ask, what clothing has been provided for us? What does God want us wearing? What's the apparel fit for this banquet? God wants us to show up with the garment he himself gave us on the day we became his adopted children. As we are vested with our baptismal garment, the baptizing priest or deacon said, You have become a new creation and clothe yourself in Christ. See in this white garment the outward sign of your Christian dignity. With your family and friends to help you by word and example, bring that dignity unstained into the everlasting life of heaven. Christ himself is meant to be our garment. We are to be clothed in him, in his risen life. As long as we live in him, vest ourselves in his virtue, then we'll always be ready and unstained for eternal life. And God provides the dry cleaning business for our baptismal garment in the sacrament of confession, where the blood of the lamb is, paradoxically, the most powerful bleach ever known. The king in the parable tells us today, come to the feast. What does he mean? means at first about the Mass on earth, and second about what the Mass points to, heaven. About both we can say, blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. If we put God first, if we respond to his invitation to life by coming to meet him, if we arrive properly dressed in an unstained baptismal garment and seek to invite others to join us, 
We can be confident that we'll always be ready to greet him when he comes, even if he comes today, to call us to that eternal wedding feast. This will be the best means for us to be numbered among the chosen few who will say in the words of King David from the psalm, we'll hear at Mass, I shall live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. God bless you. Thank you, Father Landry. To hear more from Father Landry, check out his website at catholicpreaching.com and you can also catch his writings at EWTN's own National Catholic Register. A big thank you to all our listeners for joining us. I hope that this show was helpful. I hope that it gave you more peace and more hope and more joy. And you go with our prayers. 